Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining in the Colorado Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association Lunch and Learn webinar, Understanding the Effectiveness of New Automation Weeders for Vegetable Farms. I'm Adrian Card, State Specialist in Produce with Colorado State University Extension and a founding board member of the Colorado Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. This webinar is produced in collaboration with CFEGA and will feature research from UC Davis, weed scientist Dr. Steve Finnamore, exploring the efficacy of autonomous weeding machines in California vegetable farms. Of note, these machines are currently in the marketplace uh, and recent CSU survey data showed that Colorado produce growers would seek mechanization and automation solutions if labor recruitment retention and affordability conditions did not improve. CFEGA is the go-to resource for Colorado's fruit and vegetable farmers. We connect Colorado growers with industry, government, academia, and consumers to strengthen and expand fresh fruit and vegetable production. Learn more at CFEGA's website and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. CFEGA wants to acknowledge its partners, its sponsors that make all of the uh, trade association possible, platinum sponsors currently listed on screen. Additionally, gold sponsors, silver sponsors, and more silver sponsors. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, and, and of note, uh, you can learn more about these sponsors uh, by going to CFEGA's uh, Directory of Products and Services on the website on the Growers tab. Uh, we will use the Q&A box. Uh, we have opted to answer questions primarily at the end of the presentation, but if there's something that's super pertinent and burning and something we need to interject, I'll monitor that for uh, Dr. Finnamore. You know you can resize Zoom to fit the device that you're on, and we'll have a couple of polls at the end of the presentation as well. And without further ado, I wanna introduce Dr. Steve Finnamore. He's an extension specialist with UC Davis located at Salinas, California. And since 1997, Steve has conducted a research and extension program focused on weed management in vegetables, flowers, and strawberries. And he spends most of his time working in coastal production areas between Watsonville and Oxnard, California. His program combines chemical and non-chemical methods for both organic and conventional systems with the objective of containing or reducing weed management costs of great importance to all producers. More recently, his program focuses on developing development of automated weeding systems to mitigate the severe labor shortages in California and the development of field scale steam applications to reduce the need for chemical fumigation in sensitive sites and near urban areas. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today and we'll pass over to you. Okay, get this thing up on the screen. Okay, thanks for the uh, invitation to talk to you guys. Um, actually, I'm going to primarily be talking about tractor mounted machines. Um, California regulates uh, autonomous machines. It has the distinction um, or the infamous uh, distinction of uh, being the only state that regulates. So this is still a fairly common site in the Salinas Valley, um, lots of lots of lettuce. Uh, I guarantee you with the flooding, the cost is gonna be uh, quite a bit higher than in the past. Uh, I just bought some the other day and it's, it is quite expensive. It's because fields have been uh, killed by the floods, but we still hand weed uh, because we do have, mostly have the labor available. But there is uh, the probability that we're going to move to complete mechanized system uh, sometime in, in the next decade or so. So this is where we are. Um, I am located in the, the Salinas, in Salinas is where I'm at. I'm part of the Davis campus, but I'm about a three hour drive, uh, it's about a hundred miles south of San Francisco. Um, so the, the Salinas Valley is cooled by the ocean, so even in the summertime, it's quite moderate. 70 degrees would be, anything over 70 would be a warm day. So it's a good place to grow lettuce. The other major vegetable growing areas on the coast are Santa Maria and then Oxnard. 
So this is what these machines do. This is a little bit fuzzy, but basically they weed right around the crop. These are basically automated uh, robotic hose. So I'll give you a little bit of my perspective. Uh, I'm tr I, I spent about 10 years in the agricultural chemical industry. So I've, I've been involved in that and I, I, I very much understand the economics that drives innovation with pesticide development. But much of, but now I'm in Salinas and I'm working on lettuce and I've been here for 26 years. The technology that's developed by, for, for vegetable production has developed locally. Um, if you look at that picture, that's a broccoli harvest. And you can't, there's a John Deere tractor under that pile of boxes. That's really the only thing that's, that's, that's imported from outside of the area. The rest of it is custom design equipment. So it's, it's different. Uh, I'm a weed scientist, as Adrian inter, uh, interjected. The, you know, weed science tends to be a rather passive uh, endeavor. Um, the chemical companies develop the technology. They take the risks and they hand you a jug and, and, uh, and, and give you a protocol. Uh, this is very different. We're on our own. It's much more, uh, much more freedom, but much more responsibility. So I'm, I'm very much like participating with the innovation and development. Uh, when you work with herbicides, you're working on somebody else's property. When you're working with technology, that may or may not be the case. So what's driving you know, money has, is at the heart of everything. And, and after 20 some years in extension, I, I try to understand what is the motivation for driving things. And it's hand weeding costs. So in lettuce, I mean, this is, these numbers need, are being updated right now, but the last time we published a, re, a re, cost and return study, a budget for lettuce in California, the weed control costs was $439 an acre. And over two thirds of that cost is hand weeding. It's labor. Uh, cultivation is a very small amount of it, and uh, curb the herbicide, which the predominant herbicide used in in lettuce, is less than a quarter of the cost. So what growers want to reduce is that hand weeding cost. So I'll give you basically. I work with a lot of economists and they basically state their assumptions. So you can, assumptions can be correct or they can be wrong or they can be partly right, which is usually the case. So automated weeders are less regulated than herbicides. I think that's pretty true. Less regulations allow for more innovation because cultivators are physical devices and they're not registered. You don't have a label for a cultivator uh, unless it does something with a pesticide. So I'm more than happy to not get involved with the regulation of pesticides. That picture in the lower left, that's from India. India has a lot of people that are very capable of coding and very electronic savvy. I, I visited with a, uh, an Indian professor, weed scientist at a, at a recent meeting, and he told me there were lots of people doing this. So I'm gonna show you some very expensive, high level machines. But I talked to this fellow from India and I said, how much would it cost to do that? And if I'm doing the conversion correctly, it's like less than a thousand bucks. So this doesn't have to be all you know, million dollar machines. It is possible to come up with some cost-effective solutions. It's, we're dealing with cell phones in that case. So what are they, what do these machines do and how do they work? The early machines, and they're still in use, um, this pattern recognition, basically, that's a way of saying they see the row and they see where the plants are. Their recent innovations, I mean, there's a lot of hype uh, in the press right now about artificial intelligence. Well, what the... Companies that have developed weeders have, have been using uh, deep learning. And basically, to put it quite plainly, they're teaching machines how to recognize lettuce plants, crop plants, and weeds. So the first machines, and I'll show you one, uh, the Robovator, 
uh, it rec it's basically two dimensional, you know, so the surface of a field is two dimensional, or, you know, straight ahead and right or left. And so the crop must be planted in rows. It depends on size differences. The these machines were not sophisticated. They need to see a pattern. So pattern recognition. It requires separation between the crop plants and the row. So here's a, a, a lettuce row. And so the machine sees, okay, there's one dimension, that's a straight line. And basically it goes, okay, there's a, there's a plant, there's a plant, there's a plant, there's a lettuce plant, and then it can operate. So this is the Robovator. This is was a machine made in Denmark. The Europeans got a head start on us because they have set out, uh, out to reduce herbicide use, reduce pesticide use in general. And so there was quite a bit of incentive there, as well as their high labor costs. Uh, this is coming from Denmark, which I believe they the, the Danes have told me it has some of the highest farm labor costs in the world. So they had a lot of motivations. So basically what the machines are, this is the camera, it's a detection system. And basically when, when you have a, a hoe hand, which probably everybody on this call has, has hoed weeds, you basically, the first thing you have to do is you have to see the weed. So your eyes and your brain goes, oh, there's the weed and there's the crop. So you're basically, your, your mind is the computer that's processing it. And then there's the, there's the hoe, which you move with your, your hands and your arms to chop out the weed. Basically, these machines are doing that, all of those steps. And that's what it looks like. That's the Robovator in a, in a five uh, plant line. Um, I believe that was romaine lettuce. So I'll use a couple of terms uh, on the left. That's inter-row cultivation. This is old fashioned. You, People were doing this with horses um, a long time ago. And basically it leaves an uncultivated band on the crop. And until the development of these machines, the only way, unless you had an herbicide that can take those, those weeds in the inner row space out, you, you did it with a hoe, a hoe crew. And it's still done, but it's quite expensive. They inter and intra row that's what it looks like on the right that's just what these machines are doing it looks very much like a, a, a hand crew went through there with hose but they're doing it with a machine so there are some rather uh high level technical terms algorithms basically models after the human brain uh artificial neural networks basically they're creating a very complex system so that the machine can learn itself. So basically, you, you know, at the beginning, we had to teach the machine, you had to tell it everything. Now we've got a machine that uh, once you basically set it up, it learns by itself. And these are pretty amazing. These can be trained to recognize images. People are doing all kinds of things with these. But in, I'm talking about what we're doing in the weed world. Um, these latest intelligent weeders utilize artificial neural networks, which I'm abbreviating as AN. So it recognizes the crop and the weeds, and it uses actuators to control the weeds. An actuator is just an engineering term for the device, the business end of the unit, if you like, the teeth on the tiger. Uh, this is what damages or kills the weeds or uproots it. They're Steel knives are common actuators. I mean, we've been using cultivator shovels for um, a long, long time. Um, other weeders, the more recently, they're using laser, and I'll show you that, the, uh, hot fluids, herbicide sprays. So there are a number of different actuators, and there are other things that you can do as well. So here's a couple of machines that I'll you know talk a bit elaborate a bit on. These are uh, designed to be labor efficient. Uh, the one on the one on the left is, is the, uh, the company uh, websites for both of them. Uh, Stout is basically part of Tanamura and Anil, which is a lettuce production, a, a vegetable production company. And one of the family members, um, Jeff Anil, started that company and, and there it is. Uh, these folks have been growing 
led us their whole life. So when they design a machine, it fits the market. Not too surprising about that. And it is, I'll show you the results. I'll let the results speak for itself. But it's, but I'm very high on that machine. Another very good machine is the FarmWise machine. Um, they're, they're changing. They just showed me their latest version. Um, but this is their semi-autonomous version. They basically, they created their own tractor, but uh, they're switching to a, a tractor mounted unit that goes like on a John Deere or a case or whatever color tractor you have. So these are some evaluations that I and uh, my colleague, Richard Smith, um, longtime farm advisor here, we worked together on this for quite a long time. So these are regular research trials. So there's the farm wise, there's not much to see, just a couple of seconds. Everything that's uh, going on to remove the weeds is under that hood. S whoops. So kind of gets you lined up here. There's a couple of trials. These are uh, Richard Smith's data. This is from, these are from commercial fields, uh, two trials. And we measure the hand weeding because we, we can take the number of hours per acre that um, that it takes to, to weed an area and turn that into money. And so, you know, um, 15 bucks an hour, 17 bucks an hour, if you want to include all the, the benefits and everything. Um, so there, there, you can just multiply that and, and come up with a cost per acre. Um, so they, in this case, the hand weeding cost by the, the Titan, uh, which is that orange machine, uh, was, was slightly more than half. And it removed about 69% of the weeds. In the second trial, you know, you, you, you it's 31%. Um, and then there's the hand weeding time. If you have a very light uh, population of weeds, the benefit is not as great. But that's that's what the data show. So um, this is a uh, research farm trial I did. And I'm pretty good at growing weeds. Uh, we had, I'll show you a picture of them uh, so I can try to impress you. Um, the standard cultivator removed about two thirds of the weeds and we, we measure the entire bed top. So it's a little bit different than what Richard did. And the Titan, that orange machine removed about 90%. And the, and the hand weeding in the Titan was less than half of what it was in the standard. So that's the stout machine. Looks, what it does is very similar to the Robovator, that Danish machine. Uh, this company was one of the first companies that adapted that really quickly. Um, and they like it. And here's why, and they did a good job. Um, this is some Richard's data again. Um, two trials, uh, the stout machine removed 98%. He, he just focused on like a four or five inches of the band around the lettuce plants. Whereas a standard cultivator, which doesn't reach into near the row, it, it, caught, it provided basically no weed control. So less the, the results in both of these trials are about the same. You know, four hours, four and a half hours per acre, 4.6 hours per acre with the stout machine, whereas the standard cultivator was about 11. And, and almost exactly the same results in the other study. Um, this is the kind of weed population we deal with on the research station. I always get significant differences, which is why we, we do that. So we really put it to the acid test. And I, I invited the stout guys out to, to come before they brought their machine. I said, this is kind of a mess. Do you think it'll work? They go, yeah, let's give it a whack. You know, uh, otherwise you're going to just disc it up anyway, which is about what I was to do. And they, they, I was very amazed what their machine did. You know, for a human eye to look at that, it's very hard to see the lettuce, but that machine works. That's all at purslane. And by the way, that population of purslane is about... 750,000 per acre. So it's it's hairy. So the, with the stout machine, we got, they removed 76%. Their weeding times were very high, but this is a real mess, 30 hours per acre. But the standard cultivator was uh, was 78. So um, it, it was truly a mess and the machine handled it. 
So just a summary of those two machines, the Titan, that's the orange machine, uh, reduced hand weeding between 13 to 45%. And that's usually what we get is around 40 to 50%. It resulted in 30 uh, to 69% weed control. The stout machine reduced hand weeding by six, about 60% and resulted in between 89 and 99% weed control. Both cultivators are very good, very effective. So that's spinach. Those are 80-inch um, beds, very typical uh, situation in Salinas Valley. I think, if I remember correctly, I did count those as 28 seed lines in there, and they're about an inch and a half apart. It, it Extremely difficult, basically impossible without damaging the crop to cultivate that, and growers don't cultivate things like that. So how do you deal with that with an intelligent weeder? So uh, I acknowledge Carbon Robotics. These are the laser weeder people. Uh, John May, uh, vice president of that company, loaned me these, let me use, gave me permission to use these slides. And so what basically it's able to, this machine is able to handle using the artificial neural networks. It's recognizing on the left, that's a, a carrots, and it's basically... Uh, the machine has been trained to identify where the center of the plant is, and that's exactly what you want to know. On the right is spinach, a high-density spinach, and it's, it, again, it's identifying where the heart of the plant is, the crown. So this is what it does to the to the weeds. Uh, not so pretty. Uh, burns the heck out of them. Um, it's a laser. It's a carbon dioxide laser. And that's what it looks like. It's, I'll show you some actual pictures that uh, Richard took. So uh, it uses their lighting. It's quite bright. Um, there's no shrouding. Uh, they're basically pointing out that some of the other companies have had to use a shroud so that the, the light stays constant. Um, these guys are doing it a different way. Uh, they're using lasers. These are carbon dioxide lasers, lasers, 150 watt. Um, that there's 10 per 80 inch bed. Um, you can't see the center two. They're behind that uh, shield there, but that's that's what it uses. And this is how it works. So the the laser doesn't move uh, except it basically for the targeting because the we of course it's moving around the actual laser beam is moving around so that it can target so you they're using a mirror system to target um based aimed by their camera and they're, they're targeting the weeds so this is their the uh unit that they introduced uh in 2022 i mean these guys only been in business only started and they did this in four years so it's pretty amazing and this is just on the left is some um some of the things they they require they you need at least a equivalent in the John Deere for a six thousand uh, series tractor. Um, this is listed in hectares, so it's basically they're doing a couple two to three acres an hour. I think that's probably a little fast. We've seen them go much slower. Depends on the weed population, and so this is a a three bed unit, three eighty inch beds, and so it's got thirty. 30 lasers. And on the front of the tractor, they're running off of the, the front PTO on the tractor, the way I see it set up, um, is they've got a 30 kilowatt generator. So it's a pretty significant power uh, requirement. And that's from the computers as well as, of course, as the lasers. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is in a field near Soledad, uh, which is about uh, 25 miles south of Salinas. That um, I'll see if I can get that to go on again. That smoke you see rising, that's weeds being zapped, um, being burned. And you don't see the laser beams. Um, you just see the smoke. This is what it does. So this is arugula, uh, the high planting, you know, seven, eight, uh, seven million or up to seven million plants per acre. Um, this is the, the ash or the weeds that it zapped. And look how close it's getting to the crop. You know, this this is like like a half inch, three eighths of an inch from the stem. And you know that I guess you can see this a little bit singed right there. But that that 
arugula plant's probably going to be just fine. So uh, here's some results between Richard and I. We went out and 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 followed these machines, and uh, thanks to uh, Carbon for letting us do this. Um, they've been very cooperative. We measured about 80% weed control uh, with a deviation of about, about approximately 15%. That was a Soledad at a big organic farm in San Lucas, which is about 60 miles south of Salinas. Uh, we got 83% weed control with, a, with about 16% variation. So it has a very short window of operation. You know, it has to, the, the cameras have to be able to see the weeds and once the once the foliage of the crop, you know, like spinach arugula, they, they quickly canopy over. So you may only have a week to operate it. So that is the, if you want to say the weakness of this system. So the laser weeder, um, this the dead bed is the one. These are are fixed irrigation, and they usually have they can't till as well, and so they can't get too close to the sprinkler heads without without doing damage, like with a disc or colloid or whatever the tillage they're using. So they call it sort of the slang in the area is the dead bed. Uh, it's weedier. And so the laser weeder got about 66% of the weeds, whereas in the middle beds, they, uh, they have fewer weeds and it got almost 100% weed control. And in terms of the hours per acre, in terms of the hand weeding times, um, in the, the dead bed, it was, and this is organic, 69 hours per acre. This is a commercial field. Um, can't blame me for that one. Um, versus the laser, which was 25. And then in the middle beds, which are uh, basically normal, 26 hours per acre in the control versus 12 in the laser. So uh, summary, the intelligent weeders provide better method to control weeds. They basically can reduce hand weeding times. Have, can they completely eliminate it? Well, not quite yet, but we're working on that. Um, they empower users to control the weeds with non-herbicide technology. That's, that's kind of a big deal um, because there's a lot of risk and a little benefit, very little benefit to the ag chem companies to get involved with a crop like arugula or spinach or bok choy or lettuce. So these machines are very useful for vegetable crops. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if there's any students listening, but this this is what I'm saying to students is that, you know, you need to be, need to be prepared for this because not everybody's going to get a job with a chemical company and, and not everybody who's in pest management and not everybody's going to want to do that. Um, there's a whole new set of technology that's just emerging, and I think it has a room to run for a long time. And so, and there are a whole bunch of farmers that are in 60s and over who don't have time and don't have interest in learning all of these technologies. So to the younger generation, I say, there's your opening. We need your help. So um, I don't know if I'll get into this. This is kind of some uh, philosophical issues, but uh, I'm a public weed scientist and if I take technology from the ag chem industry, I, I am a passive participant. Um, I'm building a steam machine right now that is a physical weed control device. And I am very much an active participant in that in a way and making decisions every day. So there's, there's, there's a lot of advantages and a lot of disadvantages to the physical control. There aren't big companies out there doing exactly what you want them to do. So it 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 needs a lot of participation from a lot of people, a lot of levels of of our industries. So traditionally, uh, herbicides. There's been a flow. You know, so the ag chem companies have developed products for the major crops: corn, soybeans, wheat, rice, cotton. Um, a few other things that they might pay attention to. And so they register because that's how they pay their bills. And, and it's totally no criticism. That's just, that's just the way it is. The specialty crops are dependent upon a group like IR4 to, to help register. Um, you know, dual magnum was registered for corn 
a long, long time ago in the 70s. And so corn paid the bills. But now I believe it, Dill Magnum is registered on, you know, 70 or 80 crops at least. And that number has probably gone up. And IR4 has facilitated that. That's the traditional model. This is what I see as the, the, a big change that we have now. We've got major crops. I mean, those people are a lot of smart, talented people working on corn, soybeans, and, and et cetera. There's innovation going on there that's appropriate for theirs. Especially crops is innovation going on appropriate for the, for the technology that I've just showed you. So it's, it's kind of, it's actually pretty exciting because there's a lot of room to run. So I, I, I think, um, this is my last slide, I think the uh, people that uh, pay the bills and have provided a lot of support for, throughout the years. So that's what I have to say. Fantastic, Steve. What do you Thank guys you want to know? So much. So um, I want to start us off with a high-level question. You and I both attended the first ever uh, FIRA, which is a, a global agrobotics conference. It was held uh, first ever FIRA held in the United States in Fresno this last October. And there were several presenters there that <clears throat> used the metaphor that uh, weeding agrobotics and agrobotics broadly is really sort of in its Windows XP version. We're seeing just its infancy of what's rolling out. And there were university researchers that showed harvest aids and some that were, that were really not commercialized and the products that you're seeing now that are in the marketplace. Um, and you've been at this for a while as well, you know, seeing this own farm. Uh, how would you imagine this evolves into time, especially as some of the questions we're getting in Q&A are more about like scale appropriateness and cost and return on investment. Um, and we can start to peel back that hood in a bit, but how do you see this evolving as we're just starting the beginning of it? Well, what will it be like 40 years from now? I say, this is what I'd say to people, go back and look up what a, what a John Deere tractor looked like in 1963 or 1973. They're, they're very different. There were, there was John Deere innovated, Case did the same thing, not to pick on any favorites, they, they innovated and they brought in technology that was appropriate, GPS, and now we have laser straight rows. Um, I, I, this is going to continue to evolve. And as we get you know, faster processing, uh, these machines are going to be more capable. As we get better uh, camera guidance system, um, I work with an engineer who brought in a medical camera that was like $40,000 not practical for agriculture, but we just wanted, he wanted to see if we have the best possible camera, what will it do? And it was absolutely amazing in what it would do in this resolution. Will that become cheaper? You know, he was really excited. This is Dave Slaughter, a professor, that, that a cost of GPS uh, tra uh, receiver um, went from 25000 to $500. So uh, I, I, I think it's very exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that I think there's going to be a tremendous amount, you know, and, and, and you can, I'm sure people are going to go, this stuff is really expensive. And, you know, but, you know, hey, cell phones in 1980 were 5000 to $7,000. And well, now they're a thousand bucks. I just bought one. But um, right. anyway. Right. We're getting questions in there about, and I've heard it from growers here locally about this is great, Adrian. And I'll answer a couple of questions in this statement here, but that you know some of these are are, are uh, spanning uh, 20 feet wide. You know some of the carbons, uh, latest equipment at Slayer and Verdant's latest yeah. uh, equipment uh, 20 feet wide. I think Farmwise is you know Vulcan is now 20 feet wide, um, and some of these costs are ranging from half a million to $1.5 million for this equipment, which is incredible sticker shock. So some of the smaller farmers are wondering like almost like trickle down economics. Will there be a point in which, you know, the, the, the large farm market is consumed and this may be more crystal ball than you have, but, and that the, these companies begin to explore smaller scale equipment at lower price points. So I wish you guys could have all been at our field day. We had it here in June last year. We had a, uh, uh, company, a robotics company from San Diego, Vision Robotics, I believe it was their name. 
and they had a machine that that was about twenty thousand, and you could basically mount it on a diamond bar, and it was it was meant to be modular. So, I. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know this stuff. And 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 the robotic and the the laser guys, they have a one bed unit. Um, that's how they got started. That's what we showed at the field day here last uh, year. They're bringing so, it to Colorado too. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah they I, they told they told me they had four of those machines and they call, they just call them a demo machine. And you know, but they've I, I, last fall I'd heard that they had sold up to fifty of these machines. I don't know what the number is now. Um, so they, you know, they've identified a market and they're, they is there a better, cheaper way to do it? Um, uh, you know, these are machines that can be changed. Um, and the costs will change. I know, I know that scares a lot of people off, but look at what the Indians did and the Indian professor, right? I, with a cell phone, I said, could you, could you make that in India for a thousand bucks? He says, oh, probably less. So I know too. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, there's a company uh, and kind of riffing on Tim Farrell's question here of in the Bay Area, a uh, farm NG that was very similar looking to that Indian piece of equipment. That's just a, a toolbar. You oh, just yeah, to put right. pretty much anything on it. Um, it's not not smart in any particular way that I could tell, but it's at least remote controlled, kind of robotic like. Yeah. yeah. And NIO has a little robot. It's the French company called Oz as in wizard of oz and that that's about a I believe it's about a twenty thousand dollar machine of course you know those prices are don't hold me to that yeah um, I think farm ngs was like twelve twelve thousand yeah. yeah yeah so and most of these are in uh purchase <laughs> scenarios and uh, not service like farm wise is moving away from a service business model right like all of them are yes. really selling the equipment solely yeah yeah, no, they told me the other day they were selling the, they were, they were, they have a new version that's tractor mounted. <laughs> and that it will be, it will be sold. We have another specific question in here for the mechanical based weeders. What are the efficacies? Are the efficacies highly related to the weed species and stage of weed or crop development? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, personally, which is the weed I showed uh, massive quantities of there don't necessarily, if they're, especially if they're over four weeks past emergence, we did, we did this when I first came here. Um, they don't die. Um, you irrigate them and they, um, and they reroute. Right. Right. And uh, we're uh, addressing Stephen Smith's question. I think that um, cost, we tried to touch on it. I think that's a bit of a black box here. He's wanting to know, are the pricing stable, increasing or decreasing? <laughs> well, you can, yeah, I'm almost certain that'll be increasing, but, um, you know, will competition change the equation? Uh, I don't know. I think it, it's the, it's based on the quantity. I mean, there's a, there's a reason that John Deere makes, corn harvesters they can sell a lot of them um you know every year and and they're selling a few depending on the farm income but you know these are specialized machines and so they're expensive because they're basically handmade i mean i saw the stout machine it's basically handmade it is very well made um but it's, you know, it's like a Rolls Royce. Um, you know, I, 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 there's one, there's a couple of things I want to say about this. You know, I think, I think there's a business opportunity for people to be innovative and try to try to meet these uh, small market needs. And the other thing is uh, I was working with an economist and uh, she's retired and we talked with a, a, with a grower uh, down in Santa Maria has been working on these intelligent weeders for a long time. And we said, what is a residual value? And the economist, Laura, I was working with, she assumed, we both assumed that uh, after 10 years, the residual value of the machine would be zero. And the grower, uh, who's a very sharp guy, said, no, 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 at least 10%. So there's going to be a market for used for these these machines. And there's going to be a, a business opportunity 
for some young, innovative, maybe engineer to to maintain these machines. So it's there's there's a lot there's a lot of opportunities here, and it's much more flexible. You know, you can't take a jug of of uh, Treflan and change the molecule. If you do that and you use it, it's illegal. That's because it's an off. You know, it's, you've changed the molecule. But if you buy a uh, one of these cultivators and you know, you may void the warranty, but nobody can stop you legally from changing it. So there, there is a lot more flexibility here. Um, JB is asking if we tie in precision planting with uh, vacuum seeders or other precision planting ideas with this um, intelligent weeding systems, do we get uh, even a greater economic solution, uh, better controls, uh, and is there anyone doing trials on that that combination? Um, nobody's doing any trials on that anymore. I'll tell you what they had to learn uh, when the growers, we started out with lettuce thinners, which were basically doing, which is a sprayer, an intermittent sprayer turns off and on. Depends on the, it's a, to use to, to, to selectively kill about two thirds of the lettuce plant. So you get a nice stand. And growers were used to having, people do that and so they weren't quite the rows weren't quite as straight as they needed to be what they learned is that you got much better performance for these machines because even though we call them intelligent machines at the at the end of the day they're not very smart they 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 work a lot better when things are predictable and when i mean predictable straight rows even spacing so well planted you get a lot better performance they learned that probably 10 or 12 years ago here. And so that's, that's, yeah. Oh. Great. Okay. A um, couple of more pieces here uh, before we adjourn um, questions that still are in here. Troy, to your question, uh, what does Steve know about robotic harvesting? I've put in the chat, Western Growers has a, a global harvest automation initiative that they're leading and trying to um, improve that right now that is incredible much harder right steve than killing weeds is harvesting lettuce robotically <laughs> that's why everybody started with the weeders because they were easier a german guy told me there were 50 over 50 companies in the world that are developing intelligent weeders so hang on to your hat uh, whereas harvesting yeah i've i've seen diarigos uh harvester my gosh it's for lettuce incredibly complex mm -hmm. cuts cutting the lettuce and putting it on a belt that's the easy part the the hard part is getting it into a box a case mm -hmm. that all you know and basically it's like you're bringing a factory setting to the field mm -hmm. incredible. and it has to be clean because it's food so it's yeah and then food safety right yeah yeah yes. And John Ellis gives us sort of the parting question here. Can we get a list of various machine builders? Please feel free to e email me, John, and I'll send that over to you. But I want to give a plug that I've already put in the chat. If you want to see these companies, and we've confirmed Carbon and Barnow Precision Ag and Stout, and likely you're going to confirm FarmWise and Verdant, which is the precision spray company. They're going to come to Rocky Ford, Colorado at the CSU Arkansas Valley Research Center on Friday, June the 16th. And we're going to demo all this equipment. You guys can kick the tires, talk to the sales rep. We'll have lunch and a detailed conversation after lunch. So uh, today is just the first entree into the subject matter. Uh, we're so pleased, Steve, you could join us today. Um, and I hope I get to see you. Are you going to the uh, FIRA in uh, Salinas this fall? Yes. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm going there tomorrow to to do some planning with uh, Western growers and and some some other industry people. So Fantastic. yeah, well, yeah. I look forward to seeing you there and, and this time shaking your hand and meeting you in person instead of uh, virtually through email and Zoom. So okay, I appreciate really you good time today. Okay, okay, have a good afternoon, you guys. Thank you. You too. Yep.